We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty No. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. Good evening, everyone. My name is Franklin Smith, and I am tonight's presenter. I've recently retired from the region of Waterloo after spending the last half of my career as a supervisor of infrastructure management in the engineering and planning group in Water Services Division. The first half of my working career was spent in water operations, both at the region of Waterloo and before that with the Brantford Public Utilities Commission at the Brantford Water Treatment Plant. I first became interested in waterworks profession when I toured the water treatment plant as a Cub Scout in the late 1960s. I'm pretty sure my career path was chosen way back then. I'm pleased to be here, at least virtually, to share with you my presentation. I've titled it, The History of Water Supply in Brantford, Exploring the Early Water Supply System as it Evolved. I've included a nice selection of historic photographs that will enhance my story as we progress from the early days to the present. I've tried not to be overly technical, but some detail is necessary as it's important to the story. I hope you find it interesting. What always surprises me how, is how little people know about where their drinking water comes from. If we ask that question, typically the response is from the tap. I guess at first glance that's the correct answer. However, when you look beyond simply from the tap, the actual answer is way more than that. The story is much more complicated as is the explanation of where drinking water comes from and what is its history. Certainly, the rich history of Brantford's water supply growth is complicated, unique, and original to this community. While the use of water in this area has a long history, as Indigenous people have travelled through and resided in this area for thousands of years. As the consumption of water is necessary for human existence, it's safe to say that water has been consumed here for thousands of years. I've decided to start the discussion around 1830, as this approximates the time of settlement of the village of Brantford. Of all the municipal services, the supply of drinking water is perhaps the most important. Without safe drinking water, our society would be much different than it is today. Humans depend on safe water for drinking, cooking, washing, carrying away waste, and many other domestic needs. We need safe drinking water to exist as a living human being. The evolution of water supplies is directly tied to the founding and growth of cities. This is indeed the case for Brantford. To make my story of our water supply system more logical and organized, I've divided the time period between 1830 and present into four phases. Phase 1 starts in 1830 and continues on until 1886. Phase 2 continues from 1886 forward until 1931. Phase 3 is between 1931 and approximately 2000. Phase 4 begins there and continues up to today. Most of the focus will be on Phase 2, again between 1886 and 1930, as I personally found it the most interesting time. And this will be apparent as we continue. I'll make only brief references to the current Phase 4, as it is more of a current event than a historical event. Its history hasn't happened yet. With respect to the dates and timelines that I've referenced throughout my presentation, it's important to understand that many have been determined to the best of my ability from historic photographs, documents, reports, and occasionally educated assumptions. As I continue my research forward, my intent is to increase the accuracy of timelines, as this is currently not well documented. This is an early map of the town plot of Brantford completed by Lewis Burwell in January of 1833. 
There's a great deal of interesting information on this map. What struck me the most was the area immediately north of the settlement, actually only a few blocks from the Brantford Museum, where I am now. This area was referred to as a cedar swamp. It would be safe to assume that the local water table was high at this point in time, and significant surface water existed in the form of several flowing creeks and streams in the area. In fact, the Easterly Creek was at one point dammed in order to create a mill pond that generated power for a mill owned by John Austin Wilkes. This mill was located near the corner of Colburn Street, just east of Clarence. I'll talk about this area and the creek later, which became more significant as we moved from Phase 1 to Phase 2. With the local high water table, a swamp, creeks, and the Grand River to the south, there appears to have been water everywhere. What a great place for a community to evolve. The development of the settlement is described in great detail in the Brant Historical Society publication titled The Village of Brantford in 1830 by Roger Sharp. If you haven't had a chance to read this, I would highly recommend it. It provides an interesting snapshot in time. In 1830, Brantford was a settlement with a small population of around 350 people, and as I mentioned earlier, surrounded by swampy wetland to the north, creeks, and the Grand River to the west and south of the settlement area. In the 1830s, domestic water sources consisted of shallow dug wells, springs, and cisterns which collected rainwater, certainly not the most reliable or safest sources of water for human consumption. In 1847, Brantford became a town and council authorized Ignatius Cockshut and Duncan McKay to dig a community well and install a pump on the north side of Colburn Street, close to the Market Square. In 1861, council provided for construction of six cisterns, 12 feet in diameter and 10 feet deep throughout the populated area. Between 1860 and 1870, more than 50 fires occurred, resulting in major financial losses and high insurance costs. Up until this point in time, it could be argued that the earliest water supplies were barely adequate. Waterborne illnesses were common at this time, which very well could have been the result of contaminated drinking water, not to mention the general unhealthiness of the lifestyles typical to the time period. This is an interesting description about the abundance of liquid consumables in 1867, penned by the oldest living citizen in the city of Brantford at the time, Sam Burnley. I found it in the 1927 Brantford Expositor Anniversary Publication. It's certainly not as politically correct for 2021 as it could be, but was likely written on the humorous note at the time. We had no waterworks in those days. We dug wells for drinking water, and every spring the water would fill our backyard and make it so that the wells would be full but the wa- and the water wasn't fit to drink. Our mother used to boil the water to make tea and coffee. The children used to drink milk. It was very fortunate for the men, for we had three distilleries and two breweries. Branchford was settled with English, Irish, and Scotch, and a few Germans. The English and the Germans drank the beer, while the Scotch and the Irish drank the whiskey. There appears to have been some movement afoot to address the lack of a water supply for firefighting purposes. A water supply for domestic purposes was still not a a political issue. In 1870, Council passed a resolution approving of the Hawley System of Waterworks, which operated as a private company waterworks company, whose president was never none other than Ignatius Cockship. Initially, $20,000 was provided to erect buildings, install pumps, machinery, pipe, and hydrants, to supply water for firefighting purposes. A small pumping station was constructed near the intersection of Colburn Street and Clarence Street, complete with an attached boiler house and smokestack. Two two steam-driven rotary pumps were first installed and later upgraded with a Worthington pump with a capacity of 750,000 gallons per day. Apparently, the community was content to go without drinking water until 1886. Interestingly, it was the private sector that initiated the start of an organized water supply system in Brantford. This concept was not easily accepted by the town council, and as a result, it was several years before an agreement was reached. It may have been due to self-interest of decision-makers at the time. This was a common point of political dissension across both Upper and Lower Canada. This is a later map referred to as the bird's-eye view of Brantford in 1875. 
This was a popular map, which has almost an artistic view to it. It's presented in much larger format on a display in Lorne Park on the east side of Colburn Street West. The drawing shows the town it's in, it, in its entirety. While still not yet a city, which would not occur until 1877, the community was growing and becoming more sophisticated. There was a post office, a town hall, banks, schools, churches, hotels, and at least 24 significant industrial manufacturers. The town had come a long way in the last four decades. Relative to today's, to today's story about water systems is the enhanced part of the drawing in the upper left showing the first waterworks in Brantford. It was located on the southeast corner of Clarence and Colburn Street. It was located directly over top of a creek I referred to earlier, which is referred to as Waterworks Creek at the time. Many of us today recall the creek as East Ward Creek, which I remember as a kid in the late 1960s. While it still exists, it's pretty much encased in buried culverts and doesn't show itself until an outfall in Shallow Creek Park, close to the old fire hall. This illustration is an artist drawing of the interior of the Brantford Waterworks engine room pump house from the Canadian Illustrated News from August of 1871. This publication's purpose was to highlight significant industrial aspects of communities across Canada, including our community. Its purpose was to advertise that Brantford was a progressive town for industry to move to. At that time in history, not many communities had water systems. Water systems to fight fires, that is. However, we did. Another interesting document from the same time period is the Brantford Engine Works Waterist Improved System for Fire Protection and Water Supply. It was more of a supplier catalog or proposal for C.H. Waterson Company. It was a detailed advertisement, which was so good that the town selected them as a supplier for the first firefighting system. Likely most of the equipment was made right here in Brantford. Watrous Engine Works was located on the north east corner of Deleuze and Queen Street, which of course is the site of Brantford's next city hall. The company was owned by Charles H. Watrous and George H. Wilkes at the time. It seemed like an ideal solution, new technology, locally manufactured, successful operating experience at a few other Ontario towns, a simple system right here to deal with the menacing fires. However, with new technology, change comes quickly and is soon outdated. Also, important, remember that the source of water was a shallow creek, which under winter conditions was not a reliable source of water for the station. Fires are fought with water, not ice. Several issues drew change to a new system. As I mentioned earlier, this system was privately owned but paid for by the community, so the whole private ownership versus public ownership debate was continuing. System growth was desired, as this was a growing community. The uniqueness of this facility likely didn't lend itself to expansion and upgrading very well. Most significantly, the limited water source itself. Most likely, however, the consumer demand for not only having water for firefighting, but also for domestic drinking purposes, had finally started. This was happening all across the country. Public ownership occurred in 1886 when the municipality purchased the private company for $64,700, which included approximately nine miles of water mains. Homedale, a new site, was evaluated with the concept to collect groundwater and divert to a pumping station. The new supply was decided on with a bylaw ratified by the ratepayers on November 26th of 1888. The original pumping station was built in 1889 and upgraded in approximately 1899 and had five steam driven and two electrically driven pumps, five boilers which used coal to produce steam to drive the pumps. I believe the upgrade to have occurred in and around 1889 due likely to the economic growth of Brantford at the turn of the century. There were technological advancements such as more reliable electricity and its distribution to the community. The growth of the electric system in Brantford is another huge advancement for the city. Like the water system, its development was complicated and time-consuming as well. It's another interesting story for another time. This is a simplified drawing of what the subsurface is like in the Homedale area. In this instance, the river channel is the Grand River, plus the recent re recently constructed Penman's Hydraulic Canal. Both surface water sources contributed flow paths, which allowed water to move inwards into the porous soil and gravel. 
A clay cap exists roughly 16 feet below the surface, which in a way traps the water and creates a naturally saturated reservoir for the water. All you had to do was direct this flow to a single location, namely a pumping station. A properly designed and constructed collection system made up of pipes, valves, drains, and receiving wells would allow for water to be drawn from the surface and be filtered as it moves to the porous soil. This is basically a natural filtration system. Today we would refer to this as riverbank filtration. While originally thought to be groundwater, it was certainly surface water, and this was soon confirmed. Today we would refer to this type of supply as groundwater water under direct influence of surface water and would require significant levels of treatment. Despite being a reliable source of water, there were a few other advantages going for this particular site in Homedale. It was anticipated that water quantity would be significant because of the river and good quality because of the natural filtration. It was upstream of the town and existed as a large convenient piece of property. There would be no required purchase of water rights and it was still outside the city limits at the time, so there was likely a financial advantage to locate the proposed water pumping station here. These construction photographs, which are dated August 1912, are allowing us to see the size and magnitude of the collection system under construction. During that year, a 500-foot extension was added to the existing collection system. The system was upgraded many times between 1889 and the early 1920s. The system was basically long lengths of large diameter pipes perforated and screened and covered in gravel much like the foundation drainage system around your house. Extensions were added frequently as more capacity was required year by year. However, significant maintenance and cleaning was required to remove sediment plugging. You can think of the infiltration system as you would a pool filter system. Right after its construction, the pipes, the gravel, the backfill and sand and gravel subsurface is perfectly clean. As surface water flows through the system, particles are captured and collect and eventually plug the system. This requires purging and cleaning, just like your pool filter requires regular backwashing to keep it working. There are a few other interesting observations from these pictures. The picture on the left shows a large working crew, as the work would have been very labor intensive. The excavation and trenching and pipeline would have been tough work. I'm not sure if I see any workers with hard hats or other safety equipment much different than what we'd see today. The picture on the right is also interesting. We see a steam-driven tractor powering a portable pump that would have been used for flushing the new pipes after being installed. Also, if you look to the far right side of the picture, you can make out the square silo built in 1903. Still there as a historic building, and it's worth a visit if you get a chance. The farm was owned by the Waterworks Commission and was leased to the Berry family for farming. Later, the farmhouse was moved across the canal after a fire occurred and destroyed several farm buildings. This next slide is a 1916 drawing of the plan of the waterworks plant, which gives us an idea of how widespread and complicated the infiltration gallery was. As I mentioned earlier, the site had been added to and upgraded many times since the original twin 775 foot long pipes. There were several innovative components, which included an infiltration pond and several drilled and dug wells. Anything possible to attempt to get more water into the infiltration system was attempted. At one point, a pipe was laid all the way to the river, first to a piled crib arrangement, which is still visible to this day. A pipe was put into the river to collect water and later a succession of weirs were constructed in the river which diverted water to a small pumping station which pumped water to the infiltration gallery. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. The river didn't treat this infrastructure well as almost every year significant damage occurred during the annual ice breakup in the spring. The structure, structures were never as robust as Wilkes Dam was and is to this day. Also, Another interesting item on this drawing is the proposed Grand Trunk Branch Railway Line, which was intended to cross the canal and river to West Brant. Obviously, this never happened. I know the drawing is difficult to make out, but um, again, the intent is just to sort of illustrate how widespread and sophisticated the system actually was. This slide shows two photographs which were taken downstream of Wilkes Dam. 
The photo on the left was likely part of the first attempt to divert river water into the infiltration gallery. Steel pilings were driven into the riverbed and a pipe located below the water level, which you can see on the lower left side of the picture. This type of crib may have been successful, but the water depth is shallow and likely influenced by ice in the river months. There is a reference in the engineer's report from 1912, which stated that after the spring runoff, that the river had changed course slightly, which left the intake ineffective. Several submerged pipes were installed on the riverbed right across the river. Again, great idea, but silting likely occurred within the pipes. The picture on the right shows remnants of what was likely the second uh, weir to be built in the river. This was successful as it elevated the water course and did provide an easier flow of water into the infiltration gallery, especially after a booster pump and rough screening chamber were added. The second weir was constructed in 1924. This weir saw service until 1930 before it was demolished as water had begun to be obtained from the Homedale Canal immediately adjacent to the new treatment plant, which I'm going to refer to as Phase 3. These photographs were taken sometime after 1889. The left picture is of the superintendent's residence beside the first pumping station on the Homedale site. The conical structure on the far right is the roof over the receiving well to which the infiltrated water is collected. From here, it is pumped from the steam pumps into the distribution system and ultimately to the consumers. Also on the right is the smokestack. Coal was burned, which boiled water to produce, to produce steam. The steam power operated the booster pumps. Remember, this was the age before electrical power and it was all about steam power. This was a well-designed and constructed building. This decorative building has been formally recognized in 1994 as a historical place. The photograph on the right of, is of the pump room floor, which consisted of three steam operated pumps. While the community did not have alternating current electricity, which was necessary for industry beginning around 1892, it would be several years before less costly electricity would be supplied from Niagara Falls. Remember, while electricity was in Brantford, it wasn't always a 24-7 commodity. It was not uncommon that hydro brownouts occurred. The large pump we see is what was called a duplex double acting pump, which pumped a million and a half gallons per day from the station into the distribution system in Brantford. This pump was made by the Holly Manufacturing Company in Lockport, New York. This pump was very reliable and remained functional until the 1920s. Whoever was responsible for including this piece of equipment in the station made a good decision. It is well documented in the annual engineer's reports that this pump was the most efficient operating pump at the station. Here are two more interesting photographs taken, to the best of my knowledge, in 1899. What we see here is an upgraded waterworks plant. The photo on the left was taken looking east with the Homedale Canal on the left side. Somewhat distant is a smokestack which is likely from Slingby Manufacturing Company who at the time was a substantial industry and used a lot of water from the canal. About this time, Brantford was Canada's third largest industrial producer of exports internationally with 45 manufacturing plants here. Its industrial history mirrored the industrial growth across this country. The population of the city was almost 17,000 and Brantford was the 13th largest city in Canada. So it's completely logical to conclude that as a result of the booming economy, industrial growth drove the almost doubling of the capacity of the Brantford Waterworks at the turn of the century. The ghostly photograph on the right is taken inside the new pump house. It included two new steam driven pumps and two electrical pumps. Electricity had arrived, and while it was a new form of power, it wasn't as completely reliable as I mentioned earlier. The steam pumps were run until the early 1920s when the reliability of electricity improved dramatically. Interestingly, in an engineer's report from 1923, it stated that the Holly pump required the least amount of maintenance, but the other two older pumps were pretty much at the end of their service life. Most of the pumping, pumping was done by the two electrical three-stage centrifugal pumps you see in the forefront of the picture from about 1918 or 1990, 19, up until 1930. While well, this drawing looks complicated and very busy, 
it's actually an as-built drawing of the piping and equipment located within the plant in May of 1919. The engineers of the day did a great job of documenting both the original and expanded section of the plant into a single drawing that we see here. The piping and valving arrangements, believe it or not, are very logical and efficient. It would not have been an easy task to construct the new station almost on top of the existing operating plant. Remember that during the construction they would have had to keep the older plant functioning. On the far right of the drawing, we see a second receiving well. Remember, the city was getting larger, which required more water, so it was necessary to be able to get more water from the infiltration gallery to the pumping station. With more piping and pumps to use, the operators would have had more flexibility in order to operate the plant. After 1920, a lot of maintenance activities would have been going on. Age was catching up, and new technology was on the forefront. An interesting note that in 1915, roughly a third of the pumped water from the waterworks was used for domestic consumption, a third of the water for industrial and commercial purposes, and a third for public purposes. Water meters existed and were actually quite accurate, so industry, business, and homes would have all been metered. The total station discharge was metered so that the difference between the addition of the industrial and residential was what was referred to as public purposes, which I found kind of interesting. The number was so high, likely due to the frequency of water main breaks, the municipality was using water for dust control on roads at that time, and other things like park watering. I came across a reference in the 1915 Water Commission Annual Report, having had a few complaints saying water tastes of chlorine. Believe it or not, disinfection was kind of a new thing. After the First World War, growth continued in, in the city. The Terrace Hill area was expanding, and since this was an elevated area, it was experiencing low water pressure from the pumping station. The first remote pumping station or booster station was constructed on Albion Street approximately 1917 and was able to boost the water pressure to the top of the hill. In the early 1920s, the Usher Street elevated tank was constructed, which altered the city skyline somewhat. This was located very close to the health unit in City View Park. A Brantford Water Commission report in 1918 summarized the problem areas within the system and triggered an in-depth study of the complete water system. Most significant was the reliability of the infiltration system and the lack of current technology in terms of advancements in the water industry. One of the country's leading consulting firms from Montreal provided a report on water supply improvements for the city of Brantford, which was a recommendation how the next water system should exist. New water sources, such as the Grand River, Cleeters Brook, Whiteman's Creek, and Daubeny Creek were all assessed, and after considering water quality and water quantity, the Grand River was recommended. Groundwater supplies in this area were tested, but water quality and capacity were always poor, unlike the situation upstream in Berlin, Galt, and Waterloo, where there seemed to be an abundance of good quality groundwater. This report was basically a pre-designed report for a completely new water supply system for the city of Brantford. It would take almost a decade for the facility to be built, but it did happen. When the plant was finally operating in 1931, it was almost exactly as foreseen in the 1918 report. The major change was at the source with the canal. In fact, it used the emergency intake that was built for the 1889 plant. The original concept was to build a pipeline from above Wilkes Dam to the plant almost two kilometers away. Someone made a good decision to use the canal, which provided a buffered supply of Grand River water. So money was saved on a pipeline and resulted in a more consistent water quality for the new water treatment plant. Just a little overview here on disinfection. The importance and criticality of the disinfection process cannot be understated. Sanitary awaking and acceptance of the germ theory of disease was first started in England and had finally moved to North America. Diseases such as typhoid fever, cholera, dysentery, and other waterborne illnesses were all too common up to the time chlorination of water supplies began. Certainly the disinfection of water was one of the greatest improvements to public health, not only in Brantford but around the world. 
it remains arguably the most important aspect of water treatment to this day. Generally speaking, it was the larger communities and those that had been impacted by outbreaks of disease who first used chlorination when it finally arrived. It seems that Branford obtained this system as soon as the equipment and chemicals were commercially available. Chlorine in the form of hypochlorites, bleaching powder, and chlorides of lime was first used as a treatment against typhoid following an outbreak in Lincoln, United Kingdom in 1905. In 1909, gaseous chlorine was produced commercially by the Matheson Chemical Company in Niagara Falls, New York. In 1913, a quantitative analysis for determining chlorine levels was developed. It was called orthotoluidine. This is a critical analysis used to confirm that adequate amounts of chlorine have been applied. Essentially, chlorination was a highly effective, easy to use, and was a cost-effective process. Branford started disinfection in approximately 1907 with hypochlorites and in approximately 1915 with gaseous chlorine. The proper operation and maintenance of the numerous disinfection systems over the years have always been first and foremost for plant operators. Branford was one of the first supplies to install disinfection in Canada. They have always had the latest and most reliable chlorine system. The first chlorinator used here was built and supplied by a company called Wallace and Tiernan, the company that actually invented the equipment in the U.S. The picture on the left is the chlorine gas system taken in December of 1916. The operation of the system was relatively simple. You can compare it to the propane system on your barbecue on your deck. The chlorine is a compressed gas which exists as a liquid in the cylinder under pressure, and as the pressure of the chlorine is reduced, the liquid turns to a gas when it leaves the tank, and the gas is then mixed with the water flow and the disinfection process occurs. The operators would increase or decrease the feed rate dependent upon the flow of water from the station. The equipment on the right side of the same picture is the water flow meter display cabinet. It is a circular chart recorder that produces a paper record of the flow of water. The operators would always apply the same amount of chlorine whether the flow was half a million gallons per day or one million gallons per day. The dosage rate is critical to ensure disinfection. The chlorine system was upgraded to an automated system in 1922, which basically increased or decreased chlorine feed rate automatically rather than manually. As I mentioned earlier, chlorine gas was first commercially available in 1910, the gas feed equipment in 1913, and likely first used here in 1915. The picture on the right side shows us the boilers. Remember that steam was the first form of energy used to power the pumping station. Fueling these boilers was a very labor-intensive operation. Shoveling of coal by hand was the only way to feed the boilers. This was required 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Remember, without steam, not an ounce of water is pumped. Ultimately, there were five boilers. They would have been under constant state of cleaning and maintenance. Start repairs on one, and move to the next. When it's done, you move to the next, press repeat and keep going. We'll move to the next phase. Construction commenced in 1930, immediately west of the existing station for a new filter plant with a capacity of 6 million gallons per day. The Grand River as a direct supply was to be the source. The raw water should be filtered along with the addition of an alum coagulant in order to make filtration more efficient. Disinfection, again with gaseous chlorine, increased on-site treated storage, and a brand new high lift pumping station with brand new high lift booster pumps. An interesting um, fact is the issue of the hardness of the Grand River water. Water softening was considered at that point in time, but ruled, up, ruled out due to prohibitive capital and operating costs. Industrial customers even then recognized how hard water negatively affect their processes. The water supply would continue to supply hard water. I'd like to take an opportunity to highlight an individual who was responsi responsible for positively contributing to Branford's water supply system. The decision to build a dam or weir in the river was a big deal in the mid-1800s. A project like this was expensive and controversial. 
George Samuel Wilkes, a Brantfordite who made a difference. He was one of Brantford's first mayor in 1853. Wilkes was responsible for building the Wilkes Dam across the Grand River in Homedale in 1856 to supply hydraulic power for a flour mill, which he also built. He was criticized for such a major expense because at the time the country was in a recession. He managed the mill for a decade before selling the mill on water rights. In retrospect, his contribution on both the political and private front positively contributed to the community and Brantford's water supply system. I'm sure Mr. Wilkes had no idea how significant the decision was to construct a weir in the long run. However, this infrastructure was a good idea from a water supply perspective. The weir has been modified and repaired many times since the original structure and remains to this day. I wanted to provide some additional information on what we've referred to as Wilkes Dam. As I mentioned, it was constructed in 1856 by George Wilkes. Again, he was a prominent local citizen, mayor. He didn't actually build it. The company that built it for him was referred to as the Carson and Brillen contracting firm. A private bill was passed and documented in the Upper Canada Gazette as law on April the 7th in 1856, allowing for an act to authorize the construction of a dam and water power on the Grand River at Homedale, Brantford. Next year on April 27th of 1857, a similar bill was passed as law, an act to authorize George Wilkes of Brantford to use the water, waters of the Grand River at Homedale Township of Brantford for hydraulic purposes. So there existed even in the 1850s a formal process that individuals or companies had to go through to construct and utilize a water course. Again, the purpose of the dam was to allow for the operation of the Homedale flour mills, owned and operated by Mr. Wilkes up until 1872, which was built immediately upstream of the dam. Some remnants of the mill are still observable at the site, as seen in the photo on the left. Sometime before 1872, the canal itself was constructed and the water was used as to power the Slingsby Manufacturing Company on Mill Street, which is now Grand River Ave. The canal has been referred to as Penman's Hydraulic Canal and later simply the Homedale Canal. I haven't been able to find a lot of information on the construction of this canal. If anyone in the audience has any information on this, I'd really appreciate to talk to you about it at some point. I'd like to briefly talk about the process called filtration. This critical water treatment process has been improved upon at Brantford several times since the 1889 plant. Filtration itself goes back thousands of years. Filtration in one way or another was the first process used to treat drinking water. Water filtration is the process of removing or reducing the concentration of particulate matter, suspended particles, parasites, bacteria, algae, and other undesirable chemical and biological substances from contaminated water to produce safe and clear water. Infiltration systems were first used in Canada in 1849 in Kingston and in 1859 in Hamilton. Unfortunately, they were not overly successful. Success first came in the United States after the Civil War and then in Canada with regards to this type of filtration. The type of filtration which was occurring in Homedale started in 1890. Today, we would call this riverbank filtration, as I mentioned earlier, which is the result of extracting water from the Grand River by pumping water from a saturated zone of water into a well or tank. Rapid sand filtration, or gravity filtration, is the process by which water is pumped into a filter vessel and allowed to flow through a filter media. The Brantford plant in 1931 filtered water to which chlorine and alum had been added. The first media used as a filter material was likely just sand and later a mixture of sand and anthracite coal. This type of filtration was a vast improvement over the older filtration galleries. This new facility operated reliably and added much needed treatment capabilities and capacity to the system. The first upgrade occurred in 1950 and saw the addition of two more filters and an expanded treatment regime. Not to be forgotten, but Brantford was the first community to fluoridate its water in 1945. This was largely driven by the health department at the time. It does remain a controversial topic to this day. 
The expansion to the industrial base and population growth of communities upstream of Brantford over the years led to a rather non-ideal effect on the water quality in the Grand River. The treatment capability increased with the upgrades to the disinfection and oxidation systems. The success of these upgrades were largely a result of staff addition of Don Williams as the waterworks chemist in 1947. A further upgrade occurred in 1962, which saw the addition of a powder-activated carbon system to deal with taste and odor issues, which were readily apparent at the time. Since the early 1960s, there has been a major improvement to the quality of Grand River water, which continues to this day. The Grand River today would not be recognizable as it was 50 years ago. This slide shows two photographs which were taken when the plant was brand new in 1931. They are from a collection that were likely taken by the city's engineering department at the time to document the brand new water plant. The photo on the left shows a pristine and brand new main pump room floor. The three pumps in the foreground were Worthington centrifugal pumps, the latest pumping units of the day. The large machines in the back on the right side of the left picture were diesel engines which operated generators which produced 600 volts of electricity which provided backup power to the entire water treatment plant. The complete facility could operate off the city's electrical grid or be powered by the backup power system. The photo on the right is of the filter gallery. There were three filters at this time and they could filter up to six million gallons per day. Each filter has a control cabinet made of marble and were very decorative. These filters were in operation for over 70 years and of course included the two additional plant filters built in 1950. A large elevated tank was located on the east side of the building which provided the water which was used to backwash the filters in order to keep them in optimum working order. This new water treatment plant was a huge step from the 19th century to the 20th century. It was designed and constructed to provide the best quality water that technology at the time could, could provide, and it did. Here is another individual who made considerable contributions to the Brantford's water supply system. Don Williams, a Brantfordite who made a difference. Don was the waterworks chemist from 1947 until his retirement in 1975. He was recognized nationally and internationally as an authority on drinking water treatment practices. He published numerous articles dealing with water disinfection and fluoridation, contributed to several chemical advancements related to the process of chlorination of drinking water, and acted as an educator to water treatment plant operators throughout North America. Don definitely contributed significantly to improving our drinking water. As the community grew from a village to a town and finally to a city, the pipes buried in the ground, which is called a distribution system, grew as well. That growth has been very significant. In 1870, at the start of it all, there was just over a mile of four and six inch diameter water mains plus 18 fire hydrants. 50 years later, in 1920, we got up to 60 miles of up to 20 inch diameter water mains, 330 fire hydrants, and of course, at that point in time, we had the Albion Street Booster Station to push water up to the Terrace Hill area. In 2020, currently, we have 320 miles of up to 36-inch water mains, 3,129 fire hydrants, including four reservoirs and pumping stations, and three elevated tanks supplying four pressure zones. From the beginning, the flow capacity capabilities have gone from mere buckets per day to more than 25 million gallons per day. The photograph on the left shows us the King George Road elevated tank under construction which is visible from Highway 403 in the north end of the city in the early 1960s. As the population growth and industrial and commercial development increased and the city grew outward in all directions, the growth of the distribution system always kept up. It sure has come a long way from the one mile of water main that was part of the 1870 firefighting network along Colburn Street in the downtown core to what it is today. So in summary, the early water supplies were of poor quality and unreliable capacity, literally no more than buckets per day. 
The first significant system was for firefighting purposes, which addressed an immediate threat to the, at the time to the entire early village and town site. There was a transfer of private ownership to public ownership late in the 19th century, and there was a transition from steam power to electrical power in early in the 20th century. There was no treatment at all until disinfection finally arrived in 1907, followed by filtration and disinfection in 1931, and most recently in the year 2000 to a very sophisticated advanced treatment facility. The various systems always grew in capacity to satisfy the community's industrial, commercial, and residential growth. I hope you've enjoyed my story and found it interesting, and it's given you some insight into both where our water comes from and the history of how our drinking water system evolved. So in conclusion, our city of Brantford does in fact maintain a very rich history in terms of the evolution of its water supply systems. I'd like to acknowledge three longtime Brantford water professionals who have contributed to this presentation and contributed to the Brantford Water Treatment Plant. Wayne Carmichael, Paul Aldridge, and Jamie Wallace. Plus the following organizations who are helpful resources of information to me. The Brant Historical Society, the Brant County Museum and Archives, the City of Brantford Archives, the Grand River Conservation Authority, and the American Waterworks Association. Again, thank you for your time and attention.